It is an honor to speak with you guys. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for being guests on Leak Project. How the heck are you? Hey, Rex. Thanks so much for having me on as a co-host. The real star here, of course, is Matt LaCroix today. That's right. Matt. Thanks, guys. Um, it's really an honor to be here with both of you. I've worked with, on both of your channels many, many times. Uh, we've had a lot of great discussions, so I'm really looking forward to this one. Me too. And I think that with just a little bit of information you sent me on the phone, I read that via the intro. And on Nuke, you think on Nuke might actually be Enoch? Well, we're going we're gonna to get into that, but I, um, this information is some of the most important new information that I've shared in a long time. So this is, I consider this a very special show. Yeah, and before we get started, I just want to uh, introduce myself. I'm Chris Matthew. I'm host and creator of Forbidden Knowledge News. First, Rex, thank you so much for allowing me to co-host this uh, amazing presentation that we're about to delve into. And Matt, you have always been one of the most amazing researchers. Every time we speak, you have the most epic revelations when you, print your, uh, when you present your research. You're one of those amazing researchers that changes the game. You're digging into the deepest levels of our history, and then when you're already deep, you're looking at the details even deeper. Many other researchers are, are missing these, and you end up disclosing mind-blowing information that not only changes our perspective on history, but really gives a big F you to modern academia. And for that, Matt, I want to thank you so much, and I'm very much looking forward to this presentation. Thank you so much, Chris. It's, I really, really yeah. appreciate those kind words. I'm, I hope we can, um, you know, this information is going to hold up to that really high standard you just presented, but I think it will. Yeah, looking forward to it. Dude, let's rock and roll. I've got organic popcorn. I've got several organics around me, and I'm ready to hear this information, man. This is great. Okay, Definitely. well, let's, I guess we'll, we'll get started as we do a little bit of intro on what this information is by, um, I'll, I'll share a uh, presentation here as we go along. I think that this type of information really helps when you have something in the background to look at that's, that's relevant to what we're talking about. So I spent a lot of time on this presentation to help people really grasp the importance of what, what I'm discussing and how it connects to uh, an incredible story that goes so much further than I, uh, than I ever thought it would. And I'll this is a um, what I consider a rabbit hole of truth. Now, to give a little bit of a background here on what this is, I had a wonderful, um, inquisitive supporter email me and he wrote to me and, and I like, again, I'm saying this because I like to give credit where credit is due. So, so this person, I'm going to love remain anonymous, but they emailed me and they said, Hey Matt, have you ever looked into King Og and his connection to these ancient Kings of antiquity? And I had heard of King Og, but I hadn't really done any research. And as I started to just look a little bit into that character, it turns out he was the connection to this much, much greater story, a story that is incredibly important and, and almost mind blowing. And I think will help connect a lot of pieces of these dots for, for these researchers like, like ourselves who are trying to figure out this entire story. Like for instance, why have so many of these ancient texts talked about Kings that lived for hundreds of years, if not longer? Why did they have all this specific language talking about how they were royal bloodlines and part of an ancient um, lineage back to giants? How does all of that connect in this? Where's the evidence that that's true? You know, how do we know what this entire story is? And how, do, how does this possibly connect to Moses? And I had no idea that this was gonna go in the direction it did when I first started. As I said, it really is that title of a rabbit hole because as I started to research King Og, it unraveled this incredible story that r literally changed the entire paradigm on how I view this aspect of, um, you could say, Judaism and Christianity, and then connecting to the Book of Enoch and the Watchers and all of this stuff. So to get started, um, I created, I put this, screen, this screenshot here because I want people to get an, an idea of how significant what I'm about to talk, to, uh, talk about is. We're talking about what I think is, in many ways, lost history that's remained rather hidden, even though it's really not that hidden. I think maybe a lot of people have glossed over some of this because of how these individuals are, are, are portrayed often. So we're going to go through a whole story here and unravel something that I think is going to really spark a lot of excitement and even some anger 
I completely understand there's going to be some religious people that are going to watch this. They're going to scream blasphemy and maybe wonder why I didn't get stoned to death like back five, 600 years ago, because this is changing the entire paradigm of how we view some of these individuals in history. And so let's get started. And I want to just preface by stating as many, as many know who, who go down this, this, this path of exploring what the truth is and exploring what the evidence actually shows for our story, they quickly find out that so much of our history has been rewritten by the victors. And they've largely controlled this message. And it's a very, very polluted story of our past. And so when you are in school and you open up your textbook and you're reading about history, you get this very, very antiquated and almost deceptive version of what actually happened in the past, who these heroes of our story really are, and also how far back the story goes. And that's why when I came upon this information, even though I had that mindset of, you know, oh, we have to rethink everything in history, this still blew my mind. And I want people to understand that I don't get that excited about stuff like this unless it really is important. And so when we think of heroes in, that we've been taught our whole lives, I have talked a lot to Rex and, and Chris about individuals like St. Patrick, how St. Patrick is portrayed by the church as this great hero of Ireland when he was really quite a monster that was tasked with cleansing the Druids out of Ireland and nearby Scotland and that whole region. It, it was quite a monster, actually, and he led to um, bloodshed and all kinds of terrible things to happen. Just like on the other side, someone like Columbus, who in the 1400s sailed over and came to the Americas, and we had this fun story how, you know, he met Native Americans and they helped him and they were all sort of kumbaya and happy, but that's not the story at all. And, and he wasn't even looking for a spice trade route. That's, it's all a great lie. When you look into it, he came westward and he landed in the area around the Bahamas and he immediately found a tribe that had gold around their necklace and their necks and he captured them as slaves and forced them to tell him where the gold came from. And it led to a multi-year mining operation in Cuba and Hispaniola with these massive mines using all of the, the local indigenous people where most of them ended up dying. That's not the story I remember hearing in, in school. So what we're talking about here is just lie after lie that's been layered on top of one another to create this really fantasy-like story of our past to make it seem like everything has happened that should happen and that it's all, it's all great. But really, it's, it's not the case at all. And we're going to add another layer to this, um, I hope, today, guys. Sounds great. And how dare you talk like that about the <laughs> yeah. great Christopher Columbus. Oh, my goodness. Dude, he was a kind, loving man. He loved everybody. Right. Well, he, you know, the, the portrayal of him is, but you learn that he actually did subsequent trips back to Spain multiple times in Portugal with low, shiploads of slaves, and most of them died on the way back. It's, it's truly a horrible story. But anyway, there's so many more individuals in history like that. Like, for instance, Magellan, who we're going we're gonna to talk about giants later with him. But instead of sailing back and, and coming back to mention all these incredible things he found on his navigation, he was killed in the Philippines because he had to stop and try to convert another culture into, into, into Christianity. It's this same thing over and over again. But let's, let's get started with how this story connects to all this, for those who are patiently waiting for this. It all begins with Enoch. Now, Rex brought up how the word Enoch sounds a lot like Anak. A-N-A-K versus Enoch. And that's an interesting comparison as we're going to get going with this. So this whole story revolves around essentially Enoch, the fallen angels and the watchers, this Moses character of Judaism and Christianity, and then these sons of Anak and King Og. And that's how this story unfolds. Now, to get, to get started on this, who is Enoch? Because we get to lay a foundation here, because I'm going to talk about the book of Enoch, and some people might not fully know who he is. To separate some of the misinformation that's, that's been out there, there are two Enochs in history. There's the first Enoch, and then there's a second Enoch that came later. Now, the first Enoch, if you look in Genesis 4.17, it states that he was a son of Cain. He was a son of Cain. Okay, now Cain is this religious biblical figure that was like one of the first progenitors of the human race. He was one of the first individuals that basically was part of this 
Adam Adamu Adapa bloodline that came down from these perfect humans that were essentially created. Okay. Now it states that he was a direct son of Cain. So we're talking about, if you look at a genealogy table, this Adapa Adam, the perfect man, then Cain, then Enoch. So it's right up there with the very top of these ancient bloodlines that gets back into the heart of this um, story of, of who we really are and how far back we go and how significant and important we are. So the, he was considered in these ancient texts as the patriarch of the Nephilim. And it actually states that. And if you were to go look in the Talmud, the Hebrew Bible, it states that it, it gives a lot of connections to Enoch being connected to the land of Canaan and Anak. So we're going to get into that and how that connects to this entire story. Now, this other Enoch, the second Enoch, for those who are following a genealogy tree, he was a son of Jared. And he, he also lived a very long time. He lived 365 years, which is odd because that's you know, the amount of days that are in. If you add up those days in a year, that's how, much, how long a year would be, a rotation around. So, but the person we're focusing on this, on this presentation is the first Enoch the son of Cain, the, one of the, er, the earliest of these um, pre-humans that were later led to this entire story that we have now. Now, so that's who Enoch is. Now, Enoch was a, a great prophet, a, a great human being who was incredibly knowledgeable, and he, he supposedly had connections to all these gods and these individuals that are part of this creation story. And he states essentially that he was walking with God and all these other things, but he led to the creation of what's known as the book of Enoch. Now the book of Enoch is a Gnostic writing, Gnostic Jewish writing that came out of essentially the, um, the dead sea in 1948 in a cave. And it was found in these sealed up caves along with the dead sea scrolls and others that were deliberately sealed and hidden away because they were being sought for destruction by the Roman empire and others. And so they were hidden away. And they, kept, and they remained there until they were found in 1948 and then uncovered. But you find out later that those texts were deliberately kept out of all religious stories like the, the Old Testament and the New Testament and all of those for very specific reasons. Because Enoch states in that, in the Book of Giants, in the Book of the Watchers, that there's this completely different story of our past than we've been told. And, he, and Enoch states that there were 300 of what he calls watchers. 300 total that were part of this group of, of beings or deities that watched over our entire reality and were part of this creation story. Now, I connect those when I study the Sumerians and Akkadians, I connect those back who I think were essentially the Anunnaki. So I think it's the same thing. And Enoch states that out of the 300, 200 of those 300 became fallen. Significant number of them because they had created this perfect human man and, and woman and they lusted after how beautiful these women were. And that's how this story of the Nephilim got started. These fallen angels came down and it says Enoch states in the book of Enoch that they descended to Mount Hermon. That's the first place they came to. One of the biggest mountains in the region, they descended down to Mount Hermon and that's where it all began. The most interesting thing about that is Mount Hermon is in Lebanon. Lebanon is part of the land of Canaan. Lebanon's also the location of where the largest megalithic stones that have ever been created are on earth. The stone of the pregnant woman and the trilithon are over 1,100 tons each. We have no idea how something like that could have been moved or even created in the first place. So is it any kind of a coincidence, guys, that these supposed fallen angels landed on Mount Hermon in Lebanon, and that's where the story of these giant Nephilim began? Let me add to that. It's interesting because I've, I've been doing a lot of research into the watchers lately. And I think that there's certain verbiage and code in the book of Enoch that's actually describing uh, something not like, for example, remember when they say that they, uh, the, wa the, the watchers have sex with earth women. And so they have the Nephilim, which are giants. And they describe the giants being like 3000 cubits in size. Well, David Sarita did a, uh, math equation on that number and was able to come up with that being connected to possibly the great pyramid of Giza and sacred geometry. And the, the interesting thing is though, if you look at a giant being that size, 
it's impossible. Like gra- the gravity itself, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to send blood from, from, you know, the ground all the way up to thousand feet tall or how, cause it's actually about a mile tall. They say these giants are about a mile tall. So my point is, what is your take on the code and the numbers that are used in the book of Enoch? Like 365. Yeah, that's actually a great, great question because I, I want to uh, add to the, that same thing. Um, there's so many different theories on the actual how tall these giants were, the Nephilim and their offspring. So if you could add to that by giving your thoughts on the actual size of these Nephilim and the offspring that were created after. Sure. Well, I guess I can bring up something that I was going to bring up at the very end, but it's a good piece of evidence for this. When... Um, when it's described when they when King Og was conquered, King Og was one of the sons of Anak, part of the, the last of the Nephilim, which we're going to get into. I guess I'm going to go back and then go forwards here. But essentially, Matt, Matt, go ahead. Brother, you're so good at staying on, just stay on track. Well, no, let me just, it's okay. Let me add this in. Okay. So essentially, when they found King Og and they conquered him, his bed was um, reported to be essentially 13 and a half feet long. It was this giant bed, and I encourage everyone to look up every single thing that I'm mentioning in this, and you can go see that in the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Numbers. But King Og's bed was 13 and a half feet long. If you do those calculations based on how large a bed is with a frame, and it was made out of iron, by the way, solid iron. Why would you need a bed made out of solid iron? Unless you were very, very large, right? They calculated that based on a bed that's 13 and a half feet tall, that King Og would have been 10 feet tall. 10 feet. You know, we're not talking about the sizes that you mentioned. And that doesn't mean that he's the tallest of all the Nephilim. Magellan mentioned that some of the giants that they encountered off of Patagonia were up to 15 feet tall. So clearly they go 10, 15 feet. But I wouldn't be surprised. I've heard many other people mention that some of them may have been 20 feet. We don't really know. We don't know how big they were. But it's, they were giants. There was no other way around it. They were giants. And I think one of the reasons why sacred geometry is connected to them is that they're not what we think of as these like ogre giants that are just running around like eating people. I don't think that that may have happened in some places like Patagonia, which Magellan mentions, but largely we're talking about these bloodline king Nephilim that were on royal status governing over enormous empires because they had certain bloodlines that connected back to the gods. That's what we're, we're really referring to here in this case, which is why they may have been related to places like the Great Pyramid of Giza and some of these ancient lost civilizations. We don't know if maybe all of those kings were all Nephilim giants for the entire region. And maybe that's why in Paracas, Peru, and in, in, in Egypt, down in the Serapium, we find these giant elongated skulls that are depicted all around the world. Maybe that's this connection to these Nephilim kings that they had they were tall and they had elongated heads and that's why they were being imitated all over the world by cultures. I think that's this lost connection we're looking at. So getting back. I agree with that. No, I I agree with that. 10 to 15 feet tall. That makes sense. Um, 3000 cubits in height. That, that doesn't make sense. So yeah, the 10 and and what's interesting, Matt is you brought up how you don't think, you know, these giants were eating uh, people. Well, they, some of them were, but not all of them. There's yeah. the stories that the natives talk about these 10, 12, 14 foot giants eating the little people. And they, there's been entire civilizations of small people that were one to three feet tall and they just disappeared too. It's like Lord of the Rings out there, man. <laughs> well, they, th- yes. And I think that you find those types of small pygmy people were in places like New Zealand. We see evidence for that. But, and New Mexico. Yeah. And and so I, to be clear, I'm not saying that the giants weren't taking part in cannibalism. There is definitely evidence to show that places in North America and South America. It seems like some of the giants after the flood just lost their way and just gave up on society and turned into these monsters. Yeah, that's true. And maybe that's where all those stories came from. But But there's giants too. When we're referring to the land of Canaan and these areas around Mesopotamia, this is a totally different type of thing. These are like royal bloodline giants that were part of kings. Like, for instance, Gilgamesh was exactly one of those bloodlines. Hercules, one of those bloodlines. And these sons of Anak and, and many others. This, this is where those connections can be made. And that's why those, those individuals were revered so much in history. Because they were like gods themselves. Because they were direct bloodline descendants. So I want to get back 
to basically where we left off there. We're talking about how in the book of Enoch, it mentions that these fallen were, the reason they were, they were called fallen was because it mentions that they violated what's known as the boundaries of creation. And I've mentioned that many times, but I want people to really wrap their heads around what that phrase is. There are certain laws and rules that seem to exist in the cosmos far above us that we don't even understand. And for creators, if you're a creator being, which is what it seems like this entire thing is all about, some beings are just decide to create entire worlds and everything within them as, as the only way to, so they won't seem, I guess, have a boring eternal life of nothing. It seems like there's a, they have to have conflict or something in their life or this misery of being boredom is what it mentions in a lot of texts. But these fallen violated the boundaries of creation because these, these, these beings that they created, they then were promiscuous with and they created these, um, I guess some, some have mentioned that they were abominations basically because wasn't, it wasn't supposed to happen. That wasn't supposed to occur and that's why I think there was interest in having them get wiped out. So that's what the book of Enoch states about the Nephilim. The Nephilim were the offspring of these fallen angels, these, these gods that I think were the Sumerian Anunnaki who created these bloodline kings all around the world that they could live for hundreds to thousands of years which would explain the Sumerian king list, why those kings lived so long. They had completely different bloodlines than we have now. So as, as we're, we're moving forward here, we need to get into the book of Enoch. I mean, we need to get into the story of Moses after this book of Enoch, because essentially this is where it connects to this entire thing. Now, this is where I'm going to offend some people, and I understand that. But if you were to open up your phone and you were to go on and you were to look up, well, who is Moses? And you know, how is he related on Wikipedia? And I just want to read in quotes. It states the book of Exodus, which is what explains the story of Moses is the second book of the Bible. It tells a story about Israelites being delivered from slavery involving an Exodus from Egypt. That's why it's called the Exodus through the hand of Yahweh, the leadership of Moses revelations Revelations at the uh, biblical Mount Sinai and subsequently the dwelling, indwelling of God of Israel. So that's what you get when you read directly off of Wikipedia for this Moses character. So he's this divine prophet of Judaism and Christianity, literally one of the most important religious figures in history. Okay. And if you were to look into what is actually said about him, you find that he was the most important prophet in Judaism and one of the most important prophets in Christianity, Islam, and a number of other Abrahamic religions. So this is a major figure in history, as a lot of people know. And he essentially was the uh, authority. Uh, he wrote the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, known as the acquisition of the Torah from heaven. And I want to, so I want to give the story of what we're told with Moses, Moses and then we're going to completely break open that story and, and destroy it here. Okay. So in the books of Exodus, this is the, the fairy tale that Disney creates cartoons around and everyone la 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 sings about and thinks it's such a wonderful story, but it states in the books, in the book of Exodus that Moses was born in a time when the Isra Israelites were essentially were being, um, suppressed and, and treated terribly in Egypt, right? And he was this, um, he was this prophet who was, who was in Egypt and his, he was sent down in a basket because he was of a different bloodline, a different region and different parents. You know that story, right? He was going down the river in this reed basket and he gets picked up and then he ends up secretly being raised and eventually turns into this great hero where he leads, he leads basically the Jewish people to their homeland in Israel out of Egypt and creates this whole story. That's what we're told. And it, and it states essentially that he led to this 10 plagues and got the 10 commandments and um, on Mount Sinai. And then he, after 40 years of wandering the desert, the desert, Moses died within sight of Mount Nebo. And that, and it ends, it ends. That's the story you get of Moses. This like little fairy tale where he's this great individual in history and then it ends. But what we're about to talk about is completely different than that story. And I don't get, I'm not getting this information from some off text somewhere that, that has been rejected and is, isn't present. The actual story that, that tells you the story of Moses is within their own writings themselves. 
It's within what is known as two places, and I want people to read these. It's known as the Book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is known as the fifth book of Moses, and it's Moses, and it's part of the Hebrew Bible. So it's the fourth and the fifth book of the Hebrew Bible, Bible the Jewish Torah. It's in their own writings, this story that I'm about to read. And I knew nothing about this before I started researching it. And it completely took me on this, this path that has changed my entire perspective on this. Now, to start, guys, the land of Canaan is what's today we think of as Lebanon and Syria. Now, in Syria and Damascus region, their god was Ahura Mazda. And if you trace Ahura Mazda back into the Sumerians, I find strong connections to the Sumerian god of Enki. Okay. Whereas this individual that's supposedly talking directly to Moses, telling him what to do, giving him potentially even powers. We, some very strange things when it talks about this magic staff he had and all these different things. But that figure of Yahweh, I believe was the Sumerian equivalent of Enlil because of the connection with creating this Israelite state that we think of today. So, before I get down into the book of Enoch, I want to just mention one thing that is inc incredibly significant. I don't know if you guys know this, but in 2012, there was an, a discovery made in Averis, Egypt, near the Nile Delta, in a place called Hyksos Palace. And they found 16 giant severed hands buried, 16 of them. And Essentially, what yeah, they found. Yeah, I've heard about that. You've that's, heard about that, amazing. Right? Yes, yes, amazing. So the, the king of that region was known as King Kayan, okay, and he ruled supposedly roughly three thousand six hundred years ago, and it it stated essentially that King Kayan was paying gold for giants' hands. So if you if there was a giant somewhere ruling, he was paying to kill that giant, and then if you bring him your hand, you'll get gold. And they found sixteen giant hands buried in that site. And uh, a quote I want to read from Manfred Biotok, the Australian, uh, the Austrian archaeologist states, most of the hands are quite large and some of them are very large. But then if you go on to re read about that, you find there's no measurements given and there's no more information provided about that. That's it. The whole story ends there. Why am I mentioning that right now before I talk about Moses? Because there seems to be an organized system during this time when giant Nephilim, giant bloodlines were being hunted down for destruction, cleansed and wiped out. It was this, it seemed like there was this push by a lot of different groups to completely wipe out this bloodline that connected back to the very beginning. And I think that's entirely what Moses was tasked with from, from this story, which, which we're, we're going to get into right now. So I find it so awesome that every time you you hear Yahweh in the Bible, you can replace that with Enlil, um, the the brother of Enki. Yeah, and uh, you know these these amazing uh, stories that go back to the Sumerian tablets, and then were of course adapted for the Bible. Uh, the characters are all the same, and it gets so fascinating. It's it's such a rabbit hole. I got to add something to that. Yeah, go ahead. It, it, it's fascinating, and it's also. Bo it bothers me when I read through these texts and they all seem to have similar symbolism that's encoded, which makes me feel that the text that we have access to, even the, the stuff, if you go to Oxford University's website, you can read hundreds of these Babylonian tablets that were translated in English and they're great, right? But you can go back and read stuff from the 1800s about the Anunnaki. You can go back to the early 1900s and read stuff about the Anunnaki. But it seems as if all these people that did these translations were all a part of the same club. Are you getting where I'm going? Are, yeah. are you getting where I'm going with this? Yeah, it's a club we'll never be members of. Well, you could be if you paid your dues, but I don't want right, to be a part right. of that club. I choose freedom. I and, choose independence. And I don't think necessarily that that club means that some of those early translations, such as like George Smith back in the 1800s, were wrong. But at all, I, in fact, I think they're the most accurate we have. But I do think that there's a select few that were allowed out. And it seems like most of them were not allowed for us to see. For instance, in the Asher Bonapal Library that was found in Nineveh, Iraq, they found 30,000 cuneiform tablets. And we got some of the most significant in history, like the Atrahasis and Epic of Gilgamesh. And yet, out of that 30,000, less than one to 200 have ever been translated. 
And it's for, it, for public disclosure. It brings up incredible questions about why is that not a priority to translate every single cuneiform tablet from the Asher Bonham Paul Library, considering how significant they are in history, and have them all be showcased as this um, these great records of our past. And 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 yet we just get these little tablets here and there that are allowed out, and then the rest are just remain a complete mystery. We have no idea where most of them even went. There's an Asher Bonapal exhibit in Oxford, England, but they only have a certain percent, a certain number of those tablets even in that exhibit. It really, it really, to me, is quite telling about how, well, maybe the real juicy stuff was 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 kept in out of public reach and never shown. But regardless, right. we still get pieces of clues to this, and that's what this is all about. We're trying to figure out these clues. So, well, and gonna- Smith is great too, and I've I've read some of his stuff, and and I. And first of all, I got to say, there's many people that are a part of the club that are great people. So it, it is what it is. However, when you've got these teachings and then these numbers that they throw out there, and then you decode the, numerolo- the numerology, like for example, the 144,000 are the chosen ones in the Bible, right? Yeah. Well, they might be referring to the, the chakras all being activated and that frequency is 144,000 when all the chakras are activated. So no, I, I'm not knocking it. It's just... It's unfortunate because unless you know about the keys and the route that these people are using in the club, you know, you might be looking for mile high, mile high giants instead of the reality that they're about 10 to 15 feet tall. Like we were just. I think that's where, when you have to be an objective research and understand where there's moments where things are linear and where there's moments where things are um, metaphorical and all these other aspects, we have to, we have to be able to look at these texts from a lot of different angles and try to figure out what is supposed to mean what, and rather than just jumping to conclusions. And I think that's one of the things that I, I try to strive to do at least. Right on. And so here's Moses right here, right? Here's the 10 commandments that he was given down from Yahweh, this God who is speaking to him up on top of the great mountain, which by the way, that term, the great mountain that's used in Exodus is also used in Sumerian tablets. They refer to the great mountain as the place where Enlil resided the great and that's how you i think that i make those one of those reasons i make those connections to this being enlil that's speaking to him so i i think what this boils down to is enlil is wants to create this new state in in his name his specific bloodline of these of this the jewish israelite region here and i have it on the map right here you see jerusalem there the old the old jerusalem and then you see the Anakin region, and then you see even at the top kingdom of Og and all those things that I'm about to mention. Okay, so what is the real story? I mentioned the fairy tale that we've been told, but when you actually go read the book of Numbers and the book of Deuteronomy, you get this completely different story of Moses. Now, I don't want, I want to tell that story in the most honest and objective way I can. And when I first came across this, as I mentioned before, it was appalling. Now, I want people to read these as well. Now, According to the book of Numbers in Deuteronomy, there were 12 scouts sent by Moses to the land of Canaan. Isn't that weird, right? Like the 12 tribes of Israel. It's very, very strange that it seems like a lot of these terms were just woven into this little fairy tale. And I strongly question any of the continent exodus, whether or not any of that's even real. I I don't know. Maybe some people that know a lot more about that can, can help chime in for me. But I question the entire story of Exodus after, after I started reading Deuteronomy, the book of Numbers. Okay. And now what it states is Moses wanted to conquer the land of Canaan, the land of the Anak or the Rephaim, they called them. Now the Rephaim were known as, in Hebrew, were known as the giants. It's literally a direct translation, the Rephaim, the giants. And it states that the, the region of Canaan was called the nation of giants. Now, in this case, like Rex mentioned, we got to be careful taking things literally. Is that supposed to mean the land of giants? Yes, that's a literal, that's a literal thing they're saying there, the land of giants. Now, and I have that quote at the top there, you can read as I'm going along here from the book of Numbers. But as I said, this is the region of Syria and Lebanon. Syria, we have Palmyra that had megalithic lost technology shown in these incredible blocks on, on the base that, of um, the structure there with the columns that was destroyed by ISIS. And then meanwhile in Lebanon, we have Baalbek Lebanon, as I said, with all those incredible structures. So this region has this sophisticated technology that we don't even understand how they could have built some of these places. 
and it just happens to be where all these giant Nephilim kings were, okay? So it goes on to state that Moses wanted co to conquer the land of Canaan, not because he wanted to, but because Yahweh commanded him to. That's what's so amazing about this. Yahweh commanded him to conquer all of the kings, the Nephilim kings of Canaan, and take the land for, for, for Israel and create this giant nation. And that's where, that's why I question this, the, the language in Exodus so much, because it doesn't make any sense. If you have this great religious prophet figure that's supposed to be really good and helping everybody, how could you be a, essentially like a religious warlord at the same time? I know that might seem like a, a terrible thing to say, but let me, let me read on here and you'll see what I mean. So Moses sends these 12 spies to the land of Canaan. He sends them out to all different parts of that region to sort of explore and check it out to see what their vulnerabilities are, see what the kingdoms are like, try to get an idea about it. And they come back and they report back to Moses. And it's right in those texts. And it's, it states that they found giant clusters of grapes and, and wine that took two men to carry between a pole to bring them back. So not only are there giants, but there are these giant fruits and vegetables and all these weird things in this region that they, that they go to. And it states that, and this is a quote, the land indeed is a land flowing with milk and honey. But then it goes on to state that 10 of the 12 spies came back from exploring that region and discouraged Moses and the Israelites from even attempting to possess the land. They said that the men there, and this is in quotes, were taller and stronger than the Israelites. And moreover, this, this is a direct quote, the sons of Anak dwell in the land and they felt like grasshoppers in their presence. And that's the quote I have at the top on the screen there. That's what they said when they came back from this region. Not only were they great empires with um, armies, but the, the Nephilim kings ruled there and they were afraid. 10 out of 12 told him, don't even try to attempt it. It's, it's a dangerous region, right? So what happens? Well, in, I'm going to read some quotes here, but it, it, we get into uh, essentially a, a massive conquering battle. And this is where the heart of this, really the interesting aspect of this comes into me. So I'm going to read a quote from the book of Numbers chapter 21 right here, okay? And people can follow along if they want to here. And I have a, an image of that right here. It says, like his neighbor, Sihon of Heshbon, whom Moses had previously conquered, conquered, okay? Not a happy little religious prophet hero, a religious conqueror with great armies behind him. He says, Moses had previously conquered at the battle of Jahaz. King Og was an Amorite king, the ruler of Basham, which is the land of Canaan, which contained 60 walled cities and many unwalled towns. I want to try to back up really quick here and try to wrap people wrap their heads around this. Okay. We're talking about massive empires and kingdoms, walled cities, like I'm showing right now that had to be conquered with massive armies. I don't remember reading about that when I, when I was growing up in religious school, that he was conquering entire kingdoms and, and, and causing what I'm about to describe in a second here. So it goes on in the, in the book of Numbers chapter 20, 21 and Deuteronomy chapter 3 goes on to state, and I want to read this and break this down because this is the most incredible part of this. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say here. This is direct quote out of that, out of those texts. Next, we turned and headed for the land of Bashan, the land of Canaan, where King Og and his entire army attacked us at Edri. But the Lord told me, Yahweh, this is Yahweh speaking directly to Moses. Don't be afraid of him, for I have given your victory over King Og and his entire army, and I will give you all of his land. Treat him just as you treated King Sihon of the Amorites, who ruled Heshbon. Whoa. So that's the first little quote. So God is telling him to conquer this region just as you conquered the others. And because you're a divine prophet, that's not God. Why would a prime creator of everything in the universe that created this golden ratio Fibonacci sequence where everything's balanced and perfect, that finding harmony, want an individual to 
create great armies and wipe out others. Clearly, that's not really God. That is Enlil, this, this war, war god who essentially Enlil mean lord of the, of the sky, who basically ruled over great empires. And, 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 that, and his symbol was the eagle, the, 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 empire, the mentality of this conquering eagle. Okay? And he goes on to state, and this, this is just um, this is the part I really want people to slow down and listen to. This is probably one of the most disturbing quotes I've ever read in my life. Seriously. Listen to what I'm about to say and try to, try to use your imagination to, understand, to, to wrap your heads around this. It goes on to say right after that quote of Yahweh, So our Lord, our God, handed King Og and all of his people over to us, and we killed them all. Not a single person survived. We conquered all 60 of his towns, the entire Arab, Aragob region, and his kingdom of Bashan. Not a single town escaped our conquest. These towns were all fortified with high walls and barred gates. We also took many unwalled villages at the same time. We completely destroyed the kingdom of Bashan, just as we had destroyed King Sahon of Heshbon. This is, this is so disturbing. Again, this is from the book of Numbers in Deuteronomy in the Jewish Torah. In their own writings, it says, we destroyed all the people in every town we conquered, men, women, and children alike. But we kept all the livestock for ourselves and took plunder from all of the towns. I mean, try to imagine that. Conquering 60 walled cities. 60. I can't even imagine that. That They must have had one of the greatest armies on the earth at that time. How could you possibly do that? 60 walled cities, many, many, many towns. They killed every single woman, child, and, and man in every town. I mean, it's like watching some of those movies, movies that talk about like this medieval time when armies would come into a town and burn it all down and just cut everybody down and kill everybody. That's what Moses did. And that's what these armies were doing. So when I read this and I try to wrap my head around this, Jewish prophet in this, in this figure of Christianity. I, I, I almost am like appalled. It's some of the most disturbing language I've ever seen. It's in their own writings. I don't know how people might have missed that one. <laughs> it's a little bit disturbing to me, but it goes on. There's Matt, one more quote, guys. The, yeah, let me ahead. jump in. Let me jump in. Yeah. Because most people have read that, and most people that have the mindset of the Bible is the word of God believe that they were evil and cor- I'm just telling you what they believe this. I'm not telling you what I believe. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just telling you from their perspective, they feel like those people that were destroyed were, were evil and, and, and fallen angels and they were doing all this horrific stuff, but I clearly don't see that. So that's the power of the mind. That's the power of mind control. And that's the power of faith when you have a highly orchestrated and weaponized system that is spinning things, right? Yeah. Because they believe truly that's the word of God. They believe truly that was the right thing. So it's very, it's a very slippery slope. You have to, like you said, use discernment, but they're, they're beyond that. Right. I mean, look at all the wars that have happened in the past and there, you've got people on the left, you got people on one side and the other, and somehow they've figured out a way to get the people that aren't even involved, involved and think that the other people that we're all, we're all in this together is what I'm saying. And they just create this division by gods and, oh, well, my God's better than your God. And, and when you look at it and you read it from a perspective of reality, in my opinion, See, I read this stuff 20 years ago, and I'm like, how the hell does this make sense? Why would God tell people to destroy every man, woman, and child? Why would God do that? If God is all-knowing, why does he even need to go there? Yeah. Unless we're missing out on something here. Unless there's a deeper picture to the story. And I've even done my best to look at it from from the perspective after I broke out of this religious paradigm. Look at it from, okay, well, maybe Enlil and Moses and those people we're looking at these other people as like 
as wrong. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to look for the best way to put it, but they, they thought that they were evil. And like, we're creating artificial intelligence now that could eventually take us over, right? We're doing stuff with artificial intelligence and robotics. Well, they made people to do the work for the gods. And now we're making robots to do the work for us. It just seems like it's a cyclical thing. Yeah. Maybe Enlil thought that that was just artificial intelligence that was going to take over the world. I mean, if you were to try to create, and, and again, I'm not, I have nothing against Jewish people or any groups around the world. That's, that's not what this is about, to bash them. I'm simply trying to get to the truth of this story. But it seems like Enlil wanted to create this Israelite state that could be the, his chosen people. And when you look today at the United States' role and their connection with Israel as keeping them as this superpower, it seems very clear to me that that the eagle power controlling both of those is, is very deliberate. Now, and here's one more quote to end that, to really connect that. And Rex, and I like what you said. It's very obvious that this isn't God. This is one of these, these beings, deities that tried to play God and wanted to essentially wipe out a region that had connections back to these ancient bloodlines, Nephilim, to wipe them on the earth. Because think about what, why would you want to do that? If you could wipe out all connection to the Nephilim and the bloodline kings, you could rewrite the entire story. There wouldn't be any evidence left. There would be no way to prove, oh, well, these were of a different lineage and a different bloodline. No, they're all gone. There's no examples of them anymore. And that's, I think that's what they were trying to do. And like I mentioned before, remember, the land of Canaan, the land of Bashan, I, this, is, this is the Syria, Lebanon area. Syria, their, their ancient deity god was not Enlil, okay? It was, it was Enki. Okay, and that's, that's why I think another reason why they wanted to conquer them is because there was, seemed like there was a battle with these Sumerian gods over these different regions to see who could become um, essentially greater than the other. And that's, I, I think that's where this goes. So I want to read one more quote from, again, Book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. And it says at the end of this quote that I, that I included, it says, So we took the land of the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River all the way from the Arnon Gorge to Mount Hermon. We had now conquered all of the cities on the plateau and all of Gilead and Bashan. King Og in Bashan was the last survivor of his people. Okay, so it states that of the sons of Anak, King Og was the last of the Nephilim kings. The last one. And Enlo has his, had his sights on Moses conquering that region and wiping him out and destroying him. And we find scattered other stories like Magellan and the Romans fighting giants and seeing giants throughout history, but then they really disappeared and they were gone. And I think that really in the end, this, this story is, is, is true and it's, it's telling us really clearly what happened. And I, as I said in the beginning, I want to end on when they got to King Og, they found his bed was this ironclad bed that was 13 and a half feet long, meaning he was 10 feet tall. And they wiped him out, took over the region, and essentially we lost all of that history. Um, so just to, I guess, sum up, really, um, the language in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy is really disturbing. And, the, and what it portrays with this, this conquering warlord essentially being a completely different figure than this Jewish prophet, Christian prophet that we find in these books. And I don't really know what the truth is of the Exodus story, but I can tell you that judge a man by his actions, not what he says. If you are a conquering warlord, religious warlord, conquering regions and killing everybody, you're not a good person, okay? So clearly that's, to me, the story of who this individual was. And I think that the idea was these things were so terrible, they had to create a fantasy happy story to make him this great prophet of this region. And that's where this, this whole thing snowballed into where we are today. But I think it's important that we separate these, these lies and, from the truth so we can finally understand what this real story of our past is and how it connects to, connects to everything. Matt, man, I have to jump in. This is so amazing. I love how, you know, first of all, the Bible, when you're talking about contradictions, that's the Bible contradicts itself in so many places, you know, between the Old and New Testament. Uh, it's full of contradictions. But when you can actually just go back to these books that are there and the texts that are right in front of you. Yeah, right there. And pick, you know, pick apart the truth. Uh, I mean, you know, when you 
can step back and look at both sides, the stories that is told as the, the narrative, and then the stories that you can actually find and look and read these texts for yourself. And you've done an amazing job of picking apart that this Moses character was not this loving, uh, give us the 10 commandments, yeah. you know, bring, bring us, uh, bring these, uh, these these people out of the the uh, slavery yeah. this this character that we have all come to know in the bible to just knowing him as a warlord a conqueror of these nephilim entities these giant beings and uh thank you again that was such an amazing presentation matt thank you i appreciate that it's it's incredible go ahead rex fascinating information. And when, when I listen to these stories and when I've read the stories in the past and, and then you mentioning these specific quotes again, I think to myself, look at all the uh, countries in the past that had like a warlord or a king that helped shape that country or that nation. So unfortunately, past few thousand years anyway, the world has revolved around war and conquest and so when when you've got a nation that's built upon war and conquest and the people that are now living in that nation of course they're going to be grateful for the person that helped get them there right because yeah. you know, it's 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 so interesting to hear both sides of stories when you go through history because you and i can look at this and be like well man why didn't y'all just you know Get along, you know, uh, why don't y'all just do your thing over there? We'll do our thing over here and, uh, you know, don't hurt each other, work together because that's how I think a lot of people's mindsets are now. But if you go back then, they were jockeying for position, you know, I mean, they were, I mean, I know people in the Middle East, like, and I've talked to them about racism before and it's almost like out here, you don't really need to be because, you know, I, I out there, they, they feel like it's, they kind of need to be for survival, which is unfortunate. But when you've got people that hate each other and they're, they're, they're working together and taking the bus together, of course, there's gonna, that's going to be there. It's just a different culture, man. And, and I think that with the age of Aquarius that we're entering right now, if we can look at all this from the past and say, do we want to relive this or do we want to learn from this? If we could learn from the past and learn from those teachings instead of embrace them and say, wow, how cute. Because it's not cute. They were slaughtering people. I mean, dude, war's bad now, right? But you got people that are behind a screen that are launching missiles with drones. And they probably can't sleep at night sometimes. But imagine being in it, dude. Imagine having a sword and you're going in there and you think God's telling you to take all these people. And you're like, I mean, imagine how that would, that's got a whole different reality, man. Like that's, that you're in it, dude. Just, Rick, I mean, just yeah. imagine it from, from their perspective. You're in one of these cities in the land of Canaan, and this giant army comes in, conquers, and kills every, everyone. I mean, how dark is that? It's, it's almost it's scary to think the power that um, the religious crusades and the power that these other times have had where individuals have been made to believe that they're like a prophet of these of these gods and it has, it has it clearly has nothing to do with this prime source creator of everything it's just these jealous gods and i really do think that that's the the key to all of this would moses have conquered that region without the influences of yahweh no clearly this is these ancient sumerian gods fighting over different regions and hatred of certain bloodlines and connections back to them because ahura mazda is clearly en enki in this other in this other alternate region with connect bloodlines that connect back to Enki, I think that's where the heart of all of this comes down to. It's these ancient Sumerian gods using people as just tools to have some kind of an outcome, to become like, for instance, if you really look at the eagle and the serpent struggle that I talk about all the time, how Enki really is portrayed as the serpent all the time, the dragon, and Enlil is portrayed as the, as the eagle with other, others as well, like his sons you really can see that struggle all over earth and how the, the serpent was essentially wiped out and destroyed. Just like the, the bloodlines connected to, to Enki and back to the serpent. It's clear that the, the, the eagle has taken over and, and ruled our world. And now we have just these scattered remnants that we're trying to figure out and piece together a story that's largely been hidden and, and woven into fairy tales um, from the very beginning.
Yeah, and and like uh, Rex was saying, you know, we can compare what's happening today. Uh, this club that we're not part of, there's this still this divine right to rule mentality. Um, but right now we see this mass awakening of people. We see people rebelling against these elites that believe that they have this divine right to rule. And, you know, Matt, you earlier you were mentioning, mentioning how these are basically, you know, these are creator beings. They, wanna, they wanted to create because well, for whatever reason they were bored, but we're doing the same thing now. We're creating our own life, our own artificial intelligence, and we're mim mimicking the same thing that these God beings did. And, you know, we have to look at where we're going with our future uh, and, you know, compare it with our ancient past just to make sure that we don't destroy and, uh, ourselves like we've done probably before many times over. Exactly. So I just want to add one, one thing. Why were these the last Nephilim kings? Well, it states that most of them perished after the flood, after the great deluge of the last, which, which I believe was the, the events that led to the end of the last ice age, what known as the Younger Dryas, about 12,000 years ago, there was only a couple of these groups left that connected back to the ancient bloodlines. And I think that's why the land of Canaan was so important because they were some of the ones that survived. And I think that that's why there was, there was a lot of interest to, to cleanse and wipe them out. And it, to, so to me, to have Moses be the conqueror of the last of the Nephilim um, is really remarkable. And that's the, that's the title of the third chapter, the third chapter that I, I'm writing co-writing with Billy Carson on the new book called The Epic of Humanity. And I feel like that chapter is essentially what this presentation was, connecting Enoch with the Nephilim, with the story of Moses and, and the sons of Enoch and Neph the Nephilim kings of Canaan. Um, because it's a remarkable story and it almost is mind-blowing to think that the real version is so much different than the version that we're told. It is. That was great stuff, Matt. Thank, Thank you. you again for, for bringing this information to the world. I mean, it, you know, people may have their cognitive dissonance and, and get mad at this, but, you know, it, it's the only way we're going to grow is finding out this information, the truth about our, our ancient past. Thank you again, Matt. And thank you again, Rex, for, ha for having me co-host. Oh, thank you. It's been an honor. And, and I would like to finish this up also for, um, this is a very tough subject, right? Because uh, clearly Matthew is looking for the truth. He's looking at things from a perspective where he can take all the information and analyze it, not from a specific religion or creed. So with that being said, it's going to cause people to, you know, this is going to upset some people clearly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's not about that folks. We're, we're in this together. And, and, I, and I just want to make that very clear. I respect everybody's religion. Or if you're not religious, if you're atheist, I respect that. What are you doing as a person? What are your actions? And if we can take this and learn from these things that happened in the past, then we don't have to relive it, hopefully. So, you know, this isn't an analysis. This isn't um, in any way, shape, or form talking bad or down or negative about anyone. And I just want to make it clear, if we go back to that time and if we're watching what was going on at that time, th there's a lot of stuff that we're missing now. So, so clearly... It's, I don't want to judge anybody. And if you're a divine person, I think, or, or if, you're, if you're reaching for divinity, judging somebody, can, can, you can have your own opinions, right? But to really judge them and say, oh, well, I'm better than them or my God's better. They, is it going to help you? Is it going to help you? It might. It might. So just, just kind of keep that in mind. And, and I appreciate everybody for being here. And if we can embrace our individuality, then I feel that unity will be much easier to achieve. Yeah, so. and I, can I just give us some closing statement there, Please. Rex? Um, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. I'm not trying to bash anyone's belief system. My entire goal, and there's only one goal, is just to uncover the truth in an objective way. That's it. I'm trying to figure out where this connects. And clearly for someone like me who's looked a lot into Enoch and the Nephilim, seeing this was almost, um, to me, the, some of the best evidence I've ever seen to prove that the Nephilim were absolutely true, real and that these bloodline kings and these um, battles and all these things were going on back then. And it's it just a, a case where these things were rewritten into, into a way where you people all read the Exodus story, but I guess no one's reading Deuteronomy or the Book of Numbers, which is sort of strange, even though it's part of their own writings. So I encourage people that if, if you're supporting your religion, read what it's saying. 
See if it's something that you want to support. I'm not bashing it, but I'm just telling you, read what it's saying and see what this message is and see if it's something that's in your best interest. Because we, as um, a collective society now, a global collective society, we can no longer hide behind these um, these deceptions that have been put on in front of us and tell basically they're saying, believe this, believe this. We need to step back and really say, well, well, what is the truth and what is the real story? And I think that's the angle that I want people to understand that I'm really coming at here. Yeah. That's cool. got to look at all sides, you know, and, and I think like people read it, but it gets so, if you're not researched into ancient Babylon and most people that are religious will read the Bible if they haven't done a lot of other research into what the Bible is. And they might just go on what the pastor tells them or their friend. You know, it's, it was written by God. So they're like, okay. So they start reading Numbers and, and Deuteronomy and they're like, this is boring. What the hell does this even mean? Um, I'm going to go to the next chapter. <laughs> right? So I, it's just, you really got to do the research because you can have information right in front of your face that sounds like you said, like a fairy tale, everything's happy, unicorn lives matter. But then you find out the, the dark side. And that's the unfortunate thing is there is a dark side. Uh, so let's be the light. Be the light. Sounds great. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Hit the bell. Be well. And remember, be excellent to each other. Check out Matthew LaCroix and also Forbidden Knowledge News. So Matthew LaCroix has, uh, you've got three books now. Yeah, I'm, we're just about to release technically my third book with Billy Carson called The Epic of Humanity, um, either in the spring or summer. And that's going to be, uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Right now, it currently has even more ancient texts than the stage of time. So I want to, I'm going to raise that bar even, even further on the whole idea that not only do we need to provide the evidence for this, but we need to provide the actual most accurate translation so people can read it themselves and make up their own mind. Right on. That's what I'm talking about. Be the change you want to see. No, no, no.